And the last item here under EICS deals with the Joint Legislative Education Oversight Committee on the Dropout Prevention Pilot Report. And I'm going to ask Mr. Adam Levinson to come forward to present this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what, I have, what you have before you uh, is a draft. Uh, it's something that we uh, had to delay, um, and there's an explanation in the report why we had to delay it, basically that we uh, didn't have the student data that we needed to make some of the, um, to answer some of the questions that are required in this legislatively mandated report. Uh, we now are in a position where we feel like we had to move forward um, with the best data that we have available. And so what you see in the report um, are some uh, conversations about that data that was available. And this is, of course, uh, several weeks ago we were writing this up. And you also received yesterday some information from uh, Commonwealth High School, the focus of this, of this pilot program and this report, um, which is even an update to that information. Uh, and that is provided for your information, but, I, but also with the caveat that since we've just seen the information, we're, uh, we, DPI, are still processing it and uh, you know, there, there's still questions of uh, how much faith and, and uh, you know, reliability we can assume about this, about this data. Or I should say how, how much validity the data has because it is not coming through the official UERS uh, system. Uh, that said, um, Chairman Taylor, would you like me to walk through the, the sections, the recommendations? I could do this at, at a variety of levels. Um, um, if you're just, uh, I'm sorry, I was distracted for a few minutes. I'd like yes, to I would like okay. to, you to hit right. some of the high points, and I'm not sure what yeah. I'm doing. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes. Please. Um, before you walk through it, um, that was quite a long email and documents that we received last night. So I don't know how many people had a chance to read it and consider it, but I did. Yeah. And uh, you know, you said that it would, it's not through the normal process. Can we require them to put it through the normal process? Well, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the situation at this point um, is, is this, that the data that came through the, the standard data collection student right. uh, information system was not valid for a variety of reasons. Um, miscoding of things and, and I think as is acknowledged in the materials the school provided yesterday, some lack of understanding about how to enter that data. So um, at this point we can't they can't go back into a, a year that was closed and, and redo that. So what we asked them to do and what they, they've done um, is to try to reconstruct from their internal data systems, which is not the state data system, but the one that they use at the, at the school, um, is sort of the story for each student. And that is what they provided. And I. Okay. The reason I offered the caveat that I did is that our, our data, our student information people, um, have not had a chance to really go through that. And, and even when they do, it's, it's still not, it can't be the same as if it had been submitted through the power school in 2014-15. Um, I don't think that we have time to do a benchmarking of their internal data system to see if it's capturing things in, in the same way that power school would. So I don't anticipate that, that we will have the data as we wish we would have had it. And, and I think the best we can do is say, well, here's the data that we have. Let's consider it and, and let's see if um, you know, what conclusions you can draw from it reliably. You know, it, and, and this is a pilot, and, and the purpose of a pilot obviously is to, to see what works and what doesn't work and see what we need to change. And as I read the report, um, obviously there were concerns that jumped out dealing with accountability and, and funding. And so I, I definitely want to um, us to dig deep into all the information so that we can um, have a validated, um, you know, set of information and data to analyze this appropriately because 
you know, I, your, the facts that were presented in this report are the facts based on the information that we have. All right. Uh, Ms. Taylor. Yes. Uh, for the benefit of the board, and you may say this, but it's going to the Charter School Advisory Board next week. Next week so that we can hear from them and their analysis right. and make a recommendation to us that up to this point it's been the the office of charter school that's been working with this so mm -hmm. this is not not our last chance i mean we'll, it'll come back <coughs> to action next uh at the may meeting that's correct right. that's correct so this is the beginning mm -hmm. of your of a discussion right um and and Though we had asked for an extension to give this to Ed Oversight this month, um, we have, in fact, made the decision to delay sending it to Ed Oversight until we've had sufficient time for public discussion. Correct. So I just want the, the board to be aware of that. Yeah. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Yes, I have heard that this particular EMO is seeking expansion in other areas, and are we this contingent upon the pilot being uh, approved, or is will it, will they be able to come forth in a regular charter process? So, there is in fact uh, there are in fact two schools, uh, one already in operation, Stewart Creek, in operation in this school year. That is is the same model operated by the same PMO Education Management Organization. Um, there is a third school, um, Central Wake which was approved um, by this body and that is planning to open in 2016-17. And then, as you say, there are two others, um, Town Center and uh, Twin City, I believe, um, which are up next week in the Charter Schools Advisory Board for review of their application to, uh, to open, of course, in, in the future. Help me understand how, how we are op opening new charters when the pilot, when, as I understood this, this thing started as a pilot and then, then now we're opening more charters. How did that happen? Um, it's certainly a reasonable question. Um, they, they applied this charter schools advisory board recommended them and this committee approved them. Well, I, well, I understand that, but I'm just saying that it just seems odd that, that we created a pilot program and then we expanded those, those schools and it's entirely it's an entirely different model than we're talking about as far as regular charters and there's considerable questions and, and I, I support what they're doing in fact you know, my observation of the Commonwealth was that they were doing a very good job I just think it's a different model especially a financial model mm -hmm. um, uh, that, um, that I think that the legislature perhaps some point need some recommendations with respect to doing that because I don't know what the right funding model is, yeah. but it just seems to me that the operation of uh, the Commonwealth Charter uh, School um, at the same reimbursement rate as Myers Park High School uh, seems to be um, a little disproportionate. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, um, Mr. Collins, my memory may not totally serve me well, but the legislature created this pilot and then we had to in a very short period of time ask for applicants for the pilot and i think it was all about getting the school open quickly so they didn't go through the normal process and i so it's called a pilot but I think it's more. It was more about expediting the opening of Commonwealth or a school like Commonwealth, as I remember. Um, do you know Dr. Townsend Smith? I mean, I think you would probably. It'd be good to clarify that for us, maybe. So, so you are correct. When um, when Commonwealth applied, they went through the the, the normal process. And then later, statute changed to to specifically outline um, outlining the state to accept uh, a pilot program 
and they had to meet like three specific criteria, and those three specific criteria were the ones that uh, Commonwealth um, met, and so they were the ones that were approved to participate in the pilot pro program at that time. So but yes, it, was it was an expedited. It was process. an expedited process, yes, sir. But I think the question Mr. Collins is asking is, we know that went through. There are other schools that are similar by the same governing. Yes. Yeah, so there's there the the ones that um, uh, Mr. Lepson just outlined are using the exact same model, model funding and and all. Well, and that's my point. Right. My point is, is that, that it's clear that they had to create a special statute in order for it to create the first one, mm -hmm. and now we're expanding it. And if that's if that's the if that's the what we're going to do, that's fine. But it would seem to me that when you're reporting back to the legislature as to what's going on with these schools, one of the most significant issues has to do with whether or not the funding formula from the LEA is appropriate. And, and to me, that was the only real objection I had when looking at Commonwealth, is that the, the things that they offer at that school are very good for the students, but I have to wonder whether the reimbursement rate at the rate of a full, full of fund, fund high school in Mecklenburg County really makes sense. And I think that, that will, uh, that's just an issue that either we or the legislature needs to deal with. And, uh, I fully support what they're doing. I think it's a very good process. In fact, I have encouraged uh, many LEAs to adopt this kind of idea because um, it's obvious to me that their uh, their business model is to go into urban areas and the needs in the rural areas are just as, as prevalent and need to be addressed. And what they're doing is good stuff. Mr. Davis. I fully agree with Mr. Collins' comments. and. Uh, and in fact, in the, in the spirit of a pilot, uh, to have a pilot of only one school, I think is not really a credible approach. Maybe a pilot of three schools would lend more credibility and data and understanding. But perhaps what we elect to do is not expand beyond the three until we've had enough time to fully vet the issues that Mr. Collins is doing a great job of raising. So perhaps that's a, an approach we could take to, to fulfill our obligations in running a pilot and to fully vet the merits of this, uh, this strategy. Very good points. Any other comments, questions? So what's the action item on that? I mean, should that go back to the committee to reconsider? Is there, are there some approvals that? Uh, uh, it's, it's going to the charter school advisory board and coming back to us. But it was felt that we needed to be introduced to this today. And uh, and Mr. Levins, I, I guess we interrupted him. He's going to go through it a little bit with us. And, and let me say one more thing. We're, we're really just uh, approving. We're going to take action on the report. That we're approving the report. But I'm hearing some other. We we know we're, we're not today. The report until okay. next month. Right, but I mean that's the item that'll be coming back. But I'm hearing other concerns that we need to keep on top of mind that we can talk about later. I guess. And and uh, I would appreciate the comments of the board to go to the charter school advisory board so that they can focus their attention and give us their expert advice. That's yeah. All right. Mr. So, so this is exactly the, the point of having our discussion there's a lot to discuss and this report uh, which is which is directed by the legislation that created the pilot um, asked for certain three specific things and then a, a broader request for any recommendations to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of the pilot program funding and accountability models. So that's what you have here, and I'll just hit the, the highlights in, in particular, um, the answers to the three required questions, and then some recommendations, uh, which actually uh, speak to exactly um, Mr. Collins' point, or one of his points. So um, the three questions were, were these. Um, the number to, to provide the number of students who dropped out of high school, enrolled in the program, and completed a high school diploma. Uh, to provide the results of the alternative accountability model, because it's an alternative school, they, they had the option of selecting an alternative accountability model. You approve that. So yeah, okay. And then the uh, impact on the ADM contingency reserve. 
which is a, a funding question. So I'll go through those first. Um, uh, on page one through two, uh, you get some statistics about the, uh, the graduates, and I'll, I'll just start with uh, the broader numbers there. Uh, again, from the best available data we have, there appear to be uh, 90 students enrolled in the 12th grade at some point during the 2014-15 school year. Of those, 17 or 19 percent graduated, uh, 44 or 49 percent withdrew, and 29 or 32 percent remained in the 12th grade at the end of the year. Um, of the 17 who graduated, we have some statistics. Uh, again, best data available. Um, four, sorry, of the 17, 14 had been enrolled in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools in that same school year, 14-15. Nine appear to have transferred directly to Commonwealth. Uh, four appear to have been withdrawn from CMS for greater than a month before then enrolling in Commonwealth. And one had been in both uh, CMS and enrolled at Kennedy Charter School uh, before then enrolling in Commonwealth. One of the 17 had been at Crossroads Charter and then appears to have been withdrawn for greater than a month before enrolling. In at Commonwealth. And for two of the students, we have no information that they were ever in a North Carolina school, or that they were in a North Carolina school um, in that school year. Uh, so it, it suggests that they were either home or private school students, or could have come from out of state. We can't say for sure. Those are just the basic statistics to answer that <coughs> first question, which is really the, uh, about the 17 who graduated and how many of them had been uh, Dropouts, you know, some of that depends on what definition you use, but we want to provide uh, data about those who seem to have been withdrawn and out of school for a month or so. Sometimes you might, the layperson might consider that a dropout, even if uh, <coughs> for reporting purposes. All right, the next question um, is about the results of the alternative accountability model. This is on uh, page three of the report. And then also you can see Appendix D, which is on page 17. And the short of it is that they selected uh, option D, of, uh, which is afforded by the Alternative School Accountability Plan policy, state board policy, uh, where they could select their own plan or, and measures as long as the plan included measures of student proficiency and growth. And based on the uh, measures that you see here detailed in the report, uh, at the end of their year, they graded out as highly effective, um, which was a result that you all approved in your September 2015 board meeting. The third question, what was the impact on the ADM, average daily membership, contingency reserve? And the, the short answer is that there was no impact, and that is because in the first year of a charter school, uh, when a charter school opens, the funds for those students are pulled from the school district in which the charter school is located. So in this case, those funds all came from Charlotte-Mecklenburg schools. That's a standard procedure. Uh, looking ahead in the 15-16 school year, when we report on the second year of the pilot, if, if we do that, that, that could be a different situation. But the, the short answer is no, no effect in 14-15. All right, so those are the three sort of easy to answer questions, although it was, it was a bit challenging to get to the, this uh, graduation one because of the student data issues. Um, then we get to the recommendations, and this is, I think, where you raised some points. So when we look at the, at the funding model, um, the first recommendation, um, well, I don't know how much detail to go into here in the interest of time, but there's a section that describes the basics of of the funding model and um, and some of the basics of the Commonwealth uh, program design. So, first recommendation is to consider funding at less than 100% of the dollars per student um, figure. And the reason that's explained briefly here is that since the state is for each student essentially paying a full day rate, in other words, the same rate, it's the average uh, dollar per student from Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. Uh, but the, the uh, Commonwealth program is a, a program that is something less than a, a full day program. Each student has, is expected to come to one of two sessions that are forced, 
four hours each. Uh, again, not making a judgment about whether that's a good program design, but I think it does raise some questions about whether the, the full dollars per student that's, that's typically provided for a uh, yeah, full day program makes sense to provide for this one. Second recommendation is to consider funding at less than 100% of the ADM, of the average daily membership. And the rationale here is that the reported daily attendance rate is approximately 50 to 60% of enrollment. Again, <clears throat> that may be expected and, and appropriate given the type of school it is, um, but it does raise the question, do, does the state need to provide uh, funding assuming 100% enrollment? Because you could obviously staff the program at something uh, smaller uh, if you only expect 50 to 60 percent of the students to be there on any given day. So that's that's what this recommendation is about. Considering that, the third one related to funding um, has to do with the fact that this uh, alternative school is funded in the fifth month, rather, or excuse me, funded based on the fifth month's average daily membership rather than the first month's average daily membership, which is the basis for funding all other charter schools. Um, again, there's a rationale here, and it was actually directed in the legislation, and that is that since the school is populated primarily by students moving from other school situations over the course of the year, that this was more of a, uh, a way to capture their, kind of their high point in terms of population, and that's in roughly the February time frame. Um, the, the issue here is that um, the way the state builds budgets, uh, looking, looking ahead, once you get past the first year of a charter school, looking ahead, the state looks at, at prior history and says, well, this is how many we expect to show up in CMS, and this is how many we expect to show up at this charter school, and we build a budget based on that. So for, for the second year on, the state is essentially double budgeting, potentially, in, in that uh, students that we uh, had been in, in counted in the first month in uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg are the basis for building a budget uh, and then of course could be this very same student then counted again in the fifth month if they were someone who moved from CMS so we don't have that situation exactly with other charter schools this is new I think it, it bears some further thought about whether this uh, there needs to be a different way of, uh, of budgeting I can stop there and move on to the final recommendation, which is in the accountability realm. I think you can just go to the final. I think okay. there's enough interest that we're all going to dig deep ourselves and, and you know be prepared next month for additional questions. We should have those. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in the accountability realm, um, this recommendation is a little bit different. It's it's basically <coughs> just uh, a recommendation that that all the decision makers be aware uh, that this is a a, a unique and new circumstance to have an alternative charter school. Um, of course, we've had alternative schools for many years, but those schools are always part of a school district. And so when students move from uh, a standard comprehensive high school to an alternative school, the district, they're still within the accountability or responsibility of that very same school district. And while there may be an alternative school accountability model for the school, the, the students are still uh, you know, within the uh, accountability statistics for the school system. In this situation, we now have, um, there, it's described that most of the uh, Commonwealth students are referred, actually, from, from the school system. And so you now have a situation where the school system is referring a student uh, the student doesn't have to leave and go to this situation, but if they do, they then are not are no longer within the umbrella of that school system's accountability statistics. They they go and they may be in a very good situation at Commonwealth, but but it's a little bit different in terms of the the flow of accountability. Um, and so this recommendation is simply that everyone be aware that that's new and different. Uh, it's not saying that anyone has done anything wrong, but I think. I think given that this is a new and, and different situation, um, it behooves everyone to, to think about it deeply and make sure there are no unintended consequences of creating a new system, in a way, or a new wrinkle to the system. 
Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, that, yeah. Madam Chair, that, that's all I have in terms okay. of basic explanation. Be happy to answer your Mr. question. Alcorn. As the Charter Advisory Board is considering this, but if they can also consider as far as that accountability in the long term, would if to Mr. Collins' part about encouraging LEAs to look at this model, is it something that can be built into the public school system from the, the comment that I made yesterday as far as a dollar that goes out of the state stays out of the state? A dollar spent in the state has an economic multiplier effect to it. It's very positive. Mm -hmm. So as much as, as much of this effort that can be done by North Carolinians, uh, I would help, I'd hope they'd be able to encourage them to do it in the system, in the existing system. Um, Madam yes. Chair, sure. um, as I understand this model, it's a model <coughs> built for high population areas. So your comments, Mr. Alcorn, are right on because we we have a lot of s smaller school systems and smaller towns and cities that need to consider this kind of model or, uh, for their dropouts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, one of the issues that, that I would be most interested in knowing about this school is, is at what level their graduates are entering uh, either a community college or, or college. Um, we had a big discussion yesterday about graduation rates and, and, and whether our graduates are being produced or uh, have a, a capacity to learn and be productive in society. We all know that K-14 is sort of the model, the economic model that a student has to have to be successful. And I guess the concern that I have about an organization like this is that um, getting an adult high school equivalent degree or a GED is important, but it's not the, what the ticket that, it, that these students need to be successful. And so part of the things that I think we need to be looking at this school and many other schools like that is, is um, are the students that are receiving high school degrees having a college and career of, of pathway that is at least equivalent to what they would be getting in the local school. And um, it, it bothers me um, that um, we're not doing more innovative things for these students across the state, as Mr. Alcorn has indicated. There's nothing magical about what they're doing. It's, a, it's an intent. And I think part of the intent is an is a economic one. Mr. Shotwell can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe after the first 10 days, you're funded after 10 days, and most of your dropouts are 90-day wonders where they show up and they leave. And so from your standpoint, the fact is that you're receiving a lot more ADM money than, than actually you're educating if that happens. And so those students that are out of the, so the incentive for local government, the local agencies to do this kind of work it, because it's hard and it's difficult and, and everything is not there. And we need to provide that incentive, even if it is an al alternative funding for those districts to encourage these kind of centers to open. I mean, you know, we've definitely used the first 20 days of school to any dropouts that we've had the previous year that if they're going to come back and enroll, that, you know, well, one, you know, we have to tra track down everybody to see where they went. And, uh, and you know, that goes to our dropout rate for the previous year and things like that and so we work really hard to try to get those kids back in and try to figure out what the what the problems may be but you're right and I mean depending on what you're able to offer them sometimes they're either going to come back or not and then sometimes they'll come back after the 20 days are over with and you're not going to get funding for them until the next year 